in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Through this one, all things were made, and without this one, nothing that was made has been made. In this one was life, and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Welcome to worship this morning at Epworth United Methodist Church in Berkeley, California. I'm Kristen Stone King, pastor here at Epworth, and so grateful that you have joined in this virtual service of worship. We know that people are joining from all over the world, uh, the country, the Bay Area. We're so glad that you are here. It has been a dark and difficult week, but to gather in worship to celebrate who and whose we are is indeed a joy and a blessing. If you received my email this last Thursday, you read that we are now in the process of receiving new persons for training to be a Stephen minister. Stephen ministry is a unique and wonderful program offered at Epworth and many other churches around the country that um, pairs a trained caregiver with someone in the congregation or community who's going through grief or a life transition for spiritual accompaniment. The training will begin in October, and if this is something that you may be feeling called to do or just want to have a conversation to explore the possibility, please reach out to me or send an, an email to info at epworthberkeley.org, and we will pass that on to the Stephen Ministry leaders to reach out and follow up with you. If you didn't receive that email uh, this last Thursday, it means that you are not in our communications loop. And so I invite you to fill out one of our Connect cards. You can find the link at the top of the chat if you are watching and worshiping through Facebook Live. Or you can go to our website and, uh, and actually just type in epworthberkeley.org backslash connect. If you let us know uh, how to connect with you, we would be delighted to do so. Today, we are taking a special offering for persons who are affected by the disasters happening around us, both hurricanes and fires. And so when we come to that point in our service, you're invited to uh, either give through our online portal, epworthberkeley.org backslash donate, or you can just send a check through the regular mail to 1953 Hopkins Street, Berkeley, California, 94707. And now let us worship. As God's word is proclaimed and the scriptures are read, let us hear with joy what God has to say to us today.
Every day, hearts and bodies are breaking. Every day, the suffering of God's people continues. Though we will not turn away from the struggle, we wonder, we cry, we lament. Will power remain in the arms of the wicked forever? Will racism and anti-blackness go on perpetually? Will money ever cease to be valued over people? Every day, the choice is before us. It doesn't have to be this way. Who will we be? What kind of lives will we live? What justice will we seek? With faith, let us worship together. May the Spirit come and shape us in truth and freedom divine. Today's scripture reading is from Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4 and 11 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it quickly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Do you remember the thunderstorm we had a couple of weeks ago? The one that woke us up and there was thunder and lightning? Thunderstorms are not very common here, are they? I don't know if you've ever even experienced one before. Earthquakes are what we have here. I have friends that will say to me, how can you live in a place with earthquakes? And then I'll answer right back, well, how can you live in a place with thunderstorms? I guess we get used to our own weather systems, huh? Well, and because we've experienced earthquakes before, we know that they're not all bad. And we get used to them, we're experienced with them, so we can kind of handle that. Well, a long time ago, when my son was two, I took him and my mom back to Oklahoma to visit our family. We flew into the airport and we, we rented a car and I was driving us to my aunt's house, my mom's sister. Well, along route, the route, it started to rain really bad, and there were thunderclouds, and there was lightning, forked lightning, that kind of comes down more than one lightning bolt at a time in the fields around us. It was pretty scary. Well, that made my mom want to rem reminisce about her childhood and about all the terrible things that happened during thunderstorms during her childhood. And as I'm driving along, petrified, she tells me that a town near her farm was leveled twice by tornadoes. Well, that's all I needed to hear. I got so flustered I missed our turn off, so it even took us longer to get to my aunt's house. When we finally got there, I remember grabbing my toddler and ripping him out of his car seat and rushing into my aunt's house like the car was on fire. And my aunt and my mom and my cousins that were just coming back from a shopping trip to, to uh, Oklahoma City just sauntered in leisurely as if nothing had happened. I couldn't believe it. I called my, my aunt the other day, she's 88, and I asked her if she remembered that day when we arrived at her house. Well, of course that made her laugh and she started teasing me about how scared I was of thunderstorms. So I asked her, how did you get used to them? How did you deal with the fact that you would have them a lot? And she said, the first thing you have to do is have a storm cellar. Everybody back there does. But she said, more importantly, you need to pray. 
You need to ask God to keep you safe, to remember that God is watching over you. And she said that God created everything and we should always not be afraid to reach out for help. She said, think of creation. Everything was created by God. And just like the trees that are sturdy and strong, God wants us to be sturdy and strong too. Well, that was a good thing, to, a good image to have in my mind. I thought about trees. In fact, remember last week I was talking about redwoods, how tall they are, and yet they can withstand wind and rain. So that thought of being sturdy like a tree really hit home with me. I thought back to a time when a couple of years ago my mom was nearing the end of her life and I was struggling with that and all the responsibilities I had and so I would call my aunt and she was sturdy and strong for me and helped me get through those days and weeks and months of needing to take care of my mom and I felt like she was the tall, sturdy tree in that situation for me, and reminded me to pray, and was there somebody that I could call and would kind of check in with me and make sure I was okay, and I really appreciated that, that she was my tree during that time. Psalm 121, 7 and 8 tell us, the Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. So I want to say to you, if you ever find yourself in the middle of a storm, whether it's a real storm or a storm of the soul, don't forget to reach out to God. And you will go as you get older and live in different places and experience different types of people and living situations and different weather patterns and systems. And they might throw you at the beginning but always know you can reach out to those around you to give you hope and experience and perspective and that you can always, always talk to God because God is listening. Let's pray together. God of love, you are for us. What can ever be against us? Nothing can separate us from your love. Even when we have trouble and calamity and are in danger, we can rest in your compassion. No power in the skies above, the earth below, nothing in all of creation can separate us from your loving care for us. Thank you for keeping us safe. Amen. When that storm comes, don't run for cover. When that storm comes, don't run for cover. When that storm comes, don't run for cover. Don't run from the coming storm, for there ain't no use in running. When that rain falls, let it wash away. When the rain falls, let it wash away. When the rain falls, let it wash away. Let it wash away the falling rain, the tears and the trouble. When the lights flash. And you hear that thunder roar when the lights flash. And you hear that thunder roar when the lights flash. And you hear that thunder roar. We listen to that thunder roar and let your spirit soar when that love calls. Open up your doors. Storm comes, storm comes, don't 
for cover when the storm comes. Don't run for cover when that storm comes. Don't run for cover. Don't run from the coming storm. Cause it can't keep a storm from coming. It can't keep a storm from coming. It can't keep a storm from coming. You can't keep a storm from coming, from coming, from coming, from coming. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. One of the Bible studies of the United Methodist Church that I love the most is the Disciple Bible Study. You may be familiar with it. It's a 36-week journey through the entire Bible from beginning to end. Uh, Twelve students traveling with one leader, meeting two and a half hours each week, over nine months. Disciple Bible study is a big commitment and I've taught it three times in my ministry. I hope that at some point we can offer it at, uh, at Epworth and I can lead uh, folks through this journey. And each time I lead Disciple Bible study, I learn something new. But perhaps the most arresting thing that I have learned from Disciple Bible Study was in my first year of teaching, early in the study, when we came to the texts of Egypt, uh, the plagues of Egypt, and the Exodus. In the text, the Israelites, though once free in Egypt, have become enslaved. Moses and his brother, you'll recall the story, both Israelites, at the request of God, have faced off against the Egyptian Pharaoh, demanding that Pharaoh let their people go. The plagues of Egypt and the story of the Exodus are taught to children regularly in Sunday school. Of course, this is the same history that is retold every year as our Jewish siblings gather for the Passover observance and tell the story. And it is drawn directly from the scripture that Gus read for us today. Exodus-related questions are almost always featured in Bible quizzes and often even uh, at trivia nights. How did God tell Moses it was time for Egypt to let the Israelites go? Answer there, through a burning bush. Why did Aaron accompany his brother Moses to talk to Pharaoh? Answer there, because Moses claimed that he couldn't speak clearly enough. How many years did the Israelites wander in the desert? 40 years. What were the plagues of Egypt? Now this one is a tough one. It might even be a daily double. The 10 plagues of Egypt were water turning to blood, frogs, lice, flies, livestock pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and finally the murder of the firstborn. These are some of the most dramatic texts in the Bible and these scenes are prominent in our biblical imaginations. But what I learned that night in Disciple Bible Study is that except for the account in Exodus, there is no corroborating archaeological ev evidence in Egypt or Sinai of the plagues or the Exodus. And the plagues and the Exodus are not mentioned at all in Egyptian textual sources of the same period. How could this be? How could an event so dramatic and so prominent in our own story as a people of faith and in the story of the Jewish tradition not be foregrounded in every history of the time, let alone not be present at all? Well, let's think about this. 
We know that history is written by the winners and by those in power. And though Egypt was in power, in this instance, Egypt didn't win. So it's possible that Egyptian historians chose not to record this part of the story, or maybe they were even instructed not to record it. The Israelites were the winners, so of course they recorded it. But this doesn't explain the lack of archaeological evidence. So how do we deal with that? Well, archaeological evidence, because of its materiality, can seem objective and conclusive, but it has its limits. If we find a particular vessel we know to be used by a particular people near a place where we know there was uh, evidence of a well, we might conclude that groups of this people lived in, the, in that area. Well, that, that may or may not be true. And moreover, it cannot tell us the interpersonal or political conflict that might have been happening at the same time. So we could then go on trying to understand this historical omission and attempt to determine if the events of this story were even possible. Scholars have spent much effort arguing uh, with uh, plausible explanations for the plagues. One theory is that the plagues are the result of a volcanic eruption on the Greek island of Santorini. The ash in the eruption became airborne and the winds carried the toxic ash to Egypt. And the ash would have contained the mineral cinnabar, which could have been capable of turning the River Jordan red. The accumulated acidity in the water would have caused frogs to leap out and search for clean water. Insects would have burrowed eggs in the bodies of dead animals and human survivors, which generate, generated larvae and then adult insects. Then the volcanic ash in the atmosphere would have affected the weather, with acid rain landing on people's skin, which in turn would have caused boils. The grass would have been contaminated, poisoning animals that ate it, the humidity from the rain, and the subsequent hail would have created optimal conditions for locusts to thrive. Volcanic eruptions could also explain several days of darkness, which means nine of 10 plagues are accounted for. Another theory pins the origin of the plagues on red algae. And another theory suggests that the parting of the Red Sea as the Israelites escaped could have happened as the result of a 67 mile per hour wind sustained for four hours, exposing a reef for passage from bank to bank of the sea. But just because these, these plagues or the parting of the Red Sea could have happened does not mean that they did happen. And we're left with the fact that there is no other historical evidence of these occurrences. After living through the past few months and particularly the last few weeks, we didn't need a scientific theory to tell us that plagues could happen. We know they're possible. What we need to remember is that our scriptures are less an attempt at a factual history then they are the story of a people and their relationship to their God, our God. Though they're based in history, the purpose of our scriptures is theological. They tell us how our ancestors in faith faced betrayal and loss, how they got through times of crisis or crisis upon crisis, and what they believed about life's joys and purpose. The scriptures tell us how to live as a human community in relationship to the divine and the mysteries of our universe. All of this is about the relationship between us and God. The plagues and the ensuing exodus are traditionally viewed as the single event that gave birth to Israel as a nation of people with a particular identity and purpose in relationship to God. Though the people certainly already knew God, the plagues and exodus marked a new and significant moment in the understanding of what this relationship is about. 
Here we are in the midst of our own plagues. We are enduring the plague of COVID and the ongoing plague of white supremacy and the plague of fires, hurricanes, and now air that is foul and a sky that is hazed or red or just plain dark. So what do the plagues of Egypt have to tell us about these plagues we're enduring? And where is God in all of this? Well, first, the plagues of Egypt testify to the truth that there is suffering in the world. Now, of course, it is true that the Israelites were spared the effect of the 10 plagues brought about by God, but they were already suffering the effects of the plague of slavery. All of these plagues were brought about by the injustice perpetrated by an oppressive and ruler and state. And each time Moses and Aaron demand that Pharaoh let the people go and make clear that there will be consequences, Pharaoh refuses, then relents, then refuses again to give the people their freedom. The root of the suffering brought about by the plagues is in Pharaoh's hard-hearted and oppressive rule and in the participation by all who are part of this regime in that oppression. We know that some of the plagues we are currently enduring have their root in climate change, and we must take this opportunity to double down on our efforts to respond to our climate emergency. The bondage of creation has been perpetrated mostly by the collusion of corporations and governments against the will and health of all of the people. But when skies and waters cleared as pollution from transportation all but ceased earlier this year, we saw that a mass change in habit by the people can have a dramatic effect on the degradation of the environment. Coupled with our faithful action for policy change, we respond to God's call to us to care for creation. Yet the origin of the virus is less clear. And when one is in the midst of suffering plagues, the truth is that finding origins is only helpful in the forward looking of correcting problems, not in the backward looking temptation toward anger and blame. The first message of the plagues is also the first noble truth of Buddhism suffering happens. Suffering happens, and the scripture we have to, for today about the killing of the firstborn represents the height of suffering. It is the origin of the tradition of Passover, as I said, stemming from the Hebrew verb describing the action of the angel of death when coming to the Israelites' homes, which literally means passed over. But the original verb has connotations that are lost to us now and can also be translated as protection and compassion. And so the second message is that in the midst of suffering, God is present with God's people in protection and compassion. Finally, and most importantly, it is God who saves and delivers. Israel, Israel's deliverance from the plague of slavery is not the result of its own doing, but of God's action in relationship to the people of faith. The relationship that the people have with God is just as important as God's powerful action. Hear these words that begin Exodus chapter 6. God said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. In the midst of plagues of any kind, 
what we are to remember is that it is God who delivers us. I find it interesting that God says, I did not make myself fully known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in the midst of this suffering, God becomes more fully known. In our quest to be closer to God and to understand more and more of what God wants from us, times of suffering provide us with an open portal to know more of who God is and who we are in relationship to God. The more we let go of our desire for a time before the plagues, or a view of reality that does not see reality for what it really is, the more our suffering persists. But if we let go and turn fully toward God, God will lead us out. If we turn more deeply to our practices of prayer, of reaching out, of giving, of listening for God in all things, deliverance awaits. Friends, we are in dark and difficult times. But what we see in this seminal and pivotal story of our faith is that there is never a better time to be at one with the one who knows us, loves us, and leads us into a place of all peace and all joy beyond our own imaginings. Amen.
Greetings, Epworth. This is Misty Harvey, grateful, longtime member of Epworth. It's good to be with you all. And now is the time for prayer to raise our joys and concerns in our hearts to God. I invite you to share your prayers, either silently or out loud, wherever you are. And if you're using Facebook, on the live chat, please use first names only. If you're watching at a later time and have a prayer request, please email prayer at epworthberkeley.org. You may also request prayer or long-term spiritual care from a Stevens minister at that email address. After sharing the concerns, joys, and thoughts in our hearts up to God, we will, lift our joy, uh, we will join our voices together in the Lord's Prayer as Jesus has taught us. Regardless of what lingers on our hearts, let us lift our prayers up to God. Amen. <laughs> Just one look, one look at Jesus, and my cares will all pass away. Gallery. 
to earth to set the captives free. Yes, I know the man. Yes, I know the man. Yes, I know the man. I know the man. Jesus has always made a way. Oh, my Jesus, he's in my heart to sing. Do you know the man of Galilee? To set the captives free. Yes, I know the man. Yes, I know the man. Yes, I know the man. I know the man. She. is Mary Norwood. I'm reading the Lord's Prayer 895 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What makes a community loving is not a lack of mistakes. It is what we do after we inevitably wrong one another. A loving community is honest. It learns and grows. It seeks to mend through truth and justice and change. With God's help, we practice this in, our, in this place. In gratitude for this sacred investment we make in one another, let us bring what we have together. Today, we are taking a special offering for hurricane and fire relief. If you would like to give to this special offering, please use the line on the donate page labeled Special Gift or if you are mailing a check to Epworth at 1953 Hopkins Street, Berkeley, California, 94707, please put disaster relief in the memo line. Thank you.
Let us pray. Just and compassionate one, as we bring our offerings, we remember that economic oppression is one of the great and ongoing violences of our world, still so far from redemption. Guide our practices, individual and collective, in the stewardship of our resources. May we be faithful in sharing, redistributing, and disrupting the systems of exploitation that harm us all in body and spirit. Amen. And now may you depart from this place, renewed and refreshed, having respite from your sufferings. May you know yourself as a beloved child of God, a God who offers you protection and compassion. And may you feel yourself part of a long line of people of faith, following where God beckons and drawing others out of their suffering and into that community. Amen.